community that is Chicago Theological Seminary, our staff, our students, our faculty, our board, and our alums, I welcome you to this, our second convocation of the spring semester. Welcome to this formal and traditional experience where we ritually acknowledge our work. Welcome to all who are here today in person and via live stream. I want to remind you, you can live tweet today what Dr. Butler has to say, uh, hashtag CTS Live. I hope you are all having a wonderful spring now that it is finally becoming spring. And I wish you the best as you complete your semester. I know this is a difficult time of the year. Things are coming due. Everybody wants everything from you right now. That happens every spring. Take a deep breath. Be in your experience and know that the semester is almost over. Welcome to you all this afternoon. 
May this convocation serve as one reminder of the many reasons we are here studying and working in this place. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I welcome you to this second spring term of convocation. Our Board of Trustees comes from many different walks of life, most not in religious leadership. And so it should be no surprise to you that we take great reassurance and comfort in the work that you do here. We are personally and financially dedicated to the support of the work that each of you do. And we feel a deep sense of reward when we learn of your collaboration of study with our faculty. So thank you for your work at CTS. We commend your courage and your willingness to continue in the labor of love of learning even after you leave. And yes, many of you see the light at the end of the tunnel and graduation is close. Be of courage, bless your hearts. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A convocation is literally a gathering or assembly, and at CTS we gather several times a year to mark that part of our life together, which is devoted to learning, teaching, writing, and research. Most of you are aware by now that April is a busy month in our academic year. Many students are being examined, or hope soon to be examined, on the final projects of their degree requirements in anticipation of graduation. And we also have several important events in the coming weeks, including our Selma at 50 conference next week, our event honoring Professors Dow Edgerton, Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite, and Ted Jennings on April 30th, and our annual Castaneda lecture from Dr. Heather White on May 7th. In spite of this schedule, our faculty members continue to speak outside of CTS as well. Thus, Professor Thistlethwaite is away today at Arizona State University, where she is speaking at a conference on peacemaking from the grassroots. Professor Sing A. Yang recently spoke to the Chicago Society of Biblical Research and will speak soon to the Korean American Catholic Theological Society on topics related to the Gospel of Matthew. Professor Rachel Mikva just spoke to the Niagara Foundation about interreligious engagement and will speak this week to the Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation in Evanston on Jewish texts on immigration. Professor Rami Nashashibi will be speaking in Detroit on community organizing and urban renewal. Professor John Thomas will be speaking to the Fox Valley Association of the UCC and then in Kansas City at the Ecumenical Center on Stewardship. And I will be traveling tomorrow to Ball State University to give a lecture sponsored by the Department of Philosophy and Religion. Today, however, we all look forward to hearing from our convocation speaker. Dr. Lee H. Butler, Jr., our professor of theology and psychology, completed his BA at Bucknell University before going on to earn his MDiv at Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, his THM at Princeton Theological Seminary, and his MPhil and PhD at Drew University. After serving as assistant professor of pastoral theology at Lancaster Theological Seminary, he came to CTS in 1996 which is beginning to seem like a long time now to both of us since we arrived in the same year. Dr. Butler previously served as the founding director of our Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life, and from 2007 to 2012 as president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion. He is the author of numerous articles and essays and of three books, A Loving Home, Caring for African American Marriage and Families, published in 2000, Liberating Our Dignity, Saving Our Souls, published in 2006, and Listen, My Son, Wisdom to Help African American Fathers, published in 2010. More recently, he has been working on and lecturing about new projects, including Religion, Terror, and the American Dream, and Introducing Africana Pastoral Theology, a Narrativized Historiography, a project for which he received a research grant award this year from the American Academy of Religion. We look forward to hearing more about his recent work today as he speaks to us on the topic, Living Africana and Purple Between the Thing and the Stuff, a retrospective on my 2014 research leave. Will you pray with me? 
God of weary years and silent tears, of stony roads and bitter rods, of gleaming stars and places to stand beneath your protective hand. Move among us this hour, stir us up this day, open our hearts and minds and spirits, fill us with grace and hope. And we will be your people, and we will praise your name, and we will walk in your paths, so that mercy will flow and justice will rise, high as the listening skies. And that all who may say. Question and Answer by Langston Hughes. A world to gain. A world to gain. There's a world to gain. To 
to remake it. Good afternoon. I am delighted to read this piece. I'll be reading from the book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Harriet Jacobs, writing as Linda Brent. Brett, excuse me. You may believe what I say, for I write only that whereof I know. I was 21 years in that cage of obscene birds. I can testify from my own experience and observation that slavery is a curse to whites as well as to blacks. It makes the white fathers cruel and sensual, the sons violent and licentious. It contaminates the daughters and makes the wives wretched. As for the colored race, it needs an abler pen than mine to describe the extremity of these sufferings, the depth of their degradation. Yet few slaveholders seem to be aware of the widespread moral ruin occasioned by this wicked system. Their talk is of blighted cotton crops, not of the blight on their children's souls. President Hunt, Chairman Williams, Dean Stone, faculty, staff, students, friends of CTS, both on campus and joining us through live stream. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Good afternoon. In order to remain fresh, and on the cutting edge of current issues, every scholar must develop new approaches to doing her or his work. I've taken off my regalia, not to be less formal, but to gesture the important methodological step that I took last year. By this bold move of breaking protocol, I'm declaring we must be daring and not retreat into old models of remaining traditional or maintaining traditional disciplinary standards of theological discourse. 2014 was my year to develop new methodological resources for research and writing. What I share with you today is a retrospective on my intellectual journey, living Africana, and purple between the thing and the stuff. Living Africana. Africana is the latest construct for researching and describing African culture and life in the Americas. Living Africana, therefore, means more than wearing African clothes. The term connotes an interrogation of the lives of persons of African descent 
anywhere in the diaspora. As an identification for inquiry and discourse, Africana began primarily among scholars in North America. Africana studies differs from African studies in terms of focus. African studies tends to reflect upon the lives and cultures located on the African continent exclusively. <clears throat> Excuse me. Africana studies as an emerging discourse moves from continent to the exploration of the African diaspora. While Africana studies is very close to Afrocentricity, another forerunner, Africana tends to be less ideological. As a result, Africana studies, with its focus on honoring the cultural nuances of African descended peoples throughout the Americas, is a new and appropriate way of identifying the African origins and critical reflections of African descended people in the Americas. I always self-identify as a man who wears purple. Not only is purple regal, it is the color that signifies womanism. This identity has been formed by two influential groups of women. The first group was comprised of my mother, grandmother, aunts, and other church women who nurtured and taught me what it means to be a man and a leader. They taught me how to be courageous and how to read the signs of a suffering soul. The second group was comprised of scholars and teachers who mentored and taught me what it means to be a rigorous scholar and critical thinker. The women along my professional path, both feminist and womanist, taught me how to be a systematic thinker. Integrating the lessons taught by these two groups, I know womanism to be more than a discourse. I was initially taught to experience the methodological contours of womanism by Drs. Dolores Williams and Marcia Riggs. During the time Dr. Williams was conjuring Hagar as a source for womanist reflection, I was a student at her feet as Ishmael, who learned survival from his mother. According to Hebrew scriptures, it was Hagar and not Abraham who taught Ishmael the meaning of true manhood and how to navigate history and culture. Furthermore, for years after I earned my doctorate, although Dr. Riggs was not my primary advisor, she met with me annually to direct and correct my understandings on womanism. I continue to reach out to mentoring sisters because of my awareness of the phenomenology that is implicit in womanism. While my sensitivities can be cultivated, my experiences in the world necessitate that I maintain a mentee's posture related to my participation in womanism. The thing, <laughs> the thing is the theological category developed by Dr. James Cone, the father of black theology. The thing, which is always accompanied by the gesture, is an energizing essence. And you really have to get Dr. Terrell to demonstrate it's the thing in it. <laughs> like the breath of God that breathed life into the inanimate form molded from the dust of the ground, the thing is what gives one's theological reflection certainty power, and life. Although I've never studied with Dr. Cohn, 
He inspired me early in my career to know myself as a liberation theologian. His clarity of thought and purpose compelled me to use systematic categories to work to set the captive free, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly, to speak fire against racist ideologies, and to breathe life into those whom racism had sucked the life out of, which each professional encounter, he inspires me to work harder, to dig deeper, to ensure that my writing always has the thing in it. When I shared aspects of my project on lynching with him, while he was still writing the cross in the lynching tree, he affirmed me by poking me with his finger and saying, you're on to something. <laughs> the stuff. The stuff is the quintessential term of Dr. Charles Long, who is the preeminent scholar of the history of religions. Dr. Long says, if you're going to understand religion, which he defines as orientation, and the religion of any people, you must know what their stuff is. Engaging him in conversation about religion or the history of religions in context, he will always ask, what is their stuff? The essence of the question is to say that when you know the matter, the material, the substance that orients the people's religious compassions and passions, you not only know what gives meaning to the lives of the people, you know how the people orient themselves in the world. The stuff is a focal point that gives human beings the feeling of being in control in a world where power is elusive. But even when you recognize their stuff, you cannot become fixated upon their stuff as the center of their religion. Knowing the stuff helps you to know what religion is striving for and where the people of the religion are moving from. Martial artist Bruce Lee gives us an important lesson on fixation in Enter the Dragon. Those of you who have seen it, you can follow along with me. He says, feeling is like a finger pointing to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or will you lose all that heavenly glory. If you're concentrating on the finger, you miss the whole point that is guiding and driving and inspiring the people. You focus on the stuff, you miss out on who they are. You don't focus on the stuff. You have to know the stuff without being fixated on the stuff. 2014 became a critical turning point for my retooling because Dr. Long chose to accept me as a mentee. In March, I flew to North Carolina to spend a week studying with him. That week in North Carolina became an intensive on the formation of the Atlantic world. While there, I met his wife, Mrs. Alice Freeman Long, who is perhaps the first African-American woman graduate of CTS. While living in Chicago, she also served on the staff of the Church of the Good Shepherd for a short while, the home church of the chair of our board of trustees. My 2014 research leave was guided by the question, what is America's stuff? Although I'm now looking at the stuff, I can't give up the thing, nor can I stop living Africana and purple. Looking at the stuff America is made of, 
I worked on three research projects, which I will present topically and not chronologically. The first, this violent land, religious experience and the trauma of American culture. Violence is the fabric of American life. The violence of America is so profound that the strands of the cloth that have woven have been woven by the loom of the American psyche. We wear the narrative of our national experiences sewn together by the threads of terror. The story I tell of America is a narrativized historiography of blood, a blood that soaks the soil of America. The story of America has been told by scholars and everyday people, by historians and folk singers, by patriots and revolutionary dissenters. While there are contrasting voices that tell the story of America, both voices are necessary to declare the essence of the nation and to describe the experiences of the people who inhabit America. Dr. Long comments, due to the fact that America is the result of a European diaspora, America is a hermeneutical situation, not just for black people, but also for white people. North America, as a land of contact and conquest, has the cultural genesis in the waters of the Atlantic. To accurately define this culture, Long says, one might begin by redefining this culture as an Aboriginal, Euro-African culture. Telling the story of America versus telling the story of the colonialism that came to America shifts the narrative from the discovery of a new world to the relational negotiations between peoples with differing social histories. This encounter that was shaped by violent conquest resulted in the emergence of a particular mode of life known as the Atlantic world. We've had difficulty telling the story of the Atlantic world because telling the story of an Indian, European, African culture in America does not accommodate the narrative of a civilizing triumphalism. The Atlantic world created a myth, a dominant narrative that subverted the, the history that preexisted conquest and colonialism. Because the Atlantic world became the site of religion and violence, as well as religious violence, the new world as empire has religion and violence woven into the very fabric of its existence. Rather than telling the story of traumatizing religion and violence within the Americas, American triumphalism has constructed a narrative that focuses on celebrating Columbus Day and the discovery of a new world. Instead of telling the story of terror and mourning the loss of 600 million lives that were genocide in the Atlantic world by conquest and colonialization, Americans mold heroes out of blood-soaked clay and valorize their violence with descriptions of how the West was won as we sing America the Beautiful. A retelling of the story of America will help us to understand why violence, terror, and terrorism are so much a part of the American cultural landscape. Only by retelling the story of America can we have the opportunity to regenerate into a new human being. 
the United States of America was formed in the crucible of religion and violence, given texture by red, white, and black peoples, and sought to define itself through the acquisition of land and bodies as property. The slaughter of First Nation peoples, the lynching of black bodies, the ravaging of women's bodies as rituals of sacrifice are attempts to satisfy an insatiable appetite for power and control. In January 2014, I drove to Cairo, Illinois. I know it looks like Cairo, Cairo or Cairo, but it's Cairo, Illinois, the site of one of the notorious spectacle lynchings at the turn of the 20th century. A spectacle lynching was a major community event that coordinated cameras, poses, and one brutal assault to the body after another. Each brutality intended to entertain the crowd. Whereas spectacle lynchings were always illegal, they were nevertheless well advertised events that could gather as many as 10,000 spectators to witness and participate in this act of ritual sacrifice. On November 11th, 1909, Will James, also known as Froggy, was lynched in Cairo, Illinois, a small town at the southern end of the state, near the border that touches Missouri and Kentucky. It was this then serene looking community, now almost a ghost town, that hosted one of the historic feasts of human carnage. James was accused of the rape and murder of Ann Pelly. The details of James's final moment reveal the sadism and brutality that characterized lynching. Of the reported 10,000 who were present, 500 were women who actively participated in the spectacle. James was beaten and hung from Hustler's Arch. Then the rope broke before he died, at which point he was dragged for a few yards where his body was riddled with bullets. He was then dragged by rope to the place where Pelly's body was found. His internal organs were removed, sliced, and dispersed as souvenirs. Women are reported to have started the fire that burned his body to ashes. His charred head was severed and impaled on a pole in a park for public display. Today, that park is a veteran's memorial. On the same night James was lynched, the crowd also lynched a European-American man named Henry Salzner, accused of murdering his wife. With the mob gathered around a lamppost where Salzner stood with the noose around his neck, the mob had a worship service before they took his life. During the month of September, I attended a conference at the University of Colorado Boulder that commemorated the 150th anniversary of the Sand Creek Massacre. I sat among descendants of those who survived the massacre and listened to stories and interpretations of the events that continue to impact America. As a pivotal moment in America's Western history, Sand Creek was an Indian retreat location located approximately 200 miles southeast of Denver, Colorado.
the massacre, November 29th and 30th, 1864, was led by Colonel John Chivington, an ordained Methodist minister who attacked a peaceful encampment of Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians with his Methodist zeal and passion directed by Western Manifest Destiny. He ordered 700 soldiers to kill everyone at the Sand Creek location. <clears throat> Empowered by the governor, who had already set in motion a policy of extermination, Chibbington advanced with a determination that those who rested at Sand Creek were hostile. And according to the governor, who had his eyes on statehood, hostile Indians were an infestation. With cannon and cowardice, Chivington rode to Sand Creek, which was inhabited mostly by old women and children, and he opened fire. The soldiers pursued and killed everyone they found. No one was permitted to survive. No one permitted to surrender. This went on for approximately seven hours. On the marker that overlooks the killing field are two dates. The killing was for one day. The second day, the troops moved throughout the village, looked, looting and mutilating bodies, taking body parts as trophies and awards to adorn their uniforms. And remember, these were mostly women and children. After the conference, I spent several days in Denver doing the meticulous work of archival research in special collections, like the Silas Sewell papers that are more than 150 years old, and poring over newspapers on microfiche and microfilm. My time in the archives also included viewing artifacts from the massacre not available to the general public. In addition to archival work, I visited with Dr. George Tink Tinker, a professor at Iliff School of Theology and tribal member of the Osage Nation, who discussed with me the significance of Sand Creek and the importance of diversity within theological education. My second project, Introducing Africana Pastoral Theology, a narrativized historiography. In the spring of the year, I wrote an article on the history of Africana pastoral theology. Excited by this project, I submitted a proposal and received a grant from the American Academy of Religion in the winter to write a book on this title, Introducing Africana Pastoral Theology and Narrativized Historiography. Africana pastoral theology has deep roots within the antebellum period. These roots traceable to African culture and conjure, divination and variously coordinated healing practices, sprouted and blossomed into the theories and practices resourced by African-American care ministries today. The rituals of healing traditions that crossed the Atlantic took up residency within the invisible institution and are the theories and practices that declare the spiritual heritage of Africana pastoral theology. These theories continue to respond with human compassion to the violence and traumas of victimized African Americans within the 21st century. This heritage emphasizing healing, which restores the body and soul by restoring persons to relationship. This heritage focuses on methods that emphasize family and community, which advocated group and not individual therapeutic practices. This heritage addresses 
health concerns through the restoration of dignity. Living into this heritage, Africana pastoral theology seeks to restore and support human passion and compassion as it launches a counterattack against the evil that assaults African lives. Researching this topic includes interviewing the most senior African-American professors of pastoral theology. In the fall of the year, I interviewed two third-generation scholars currently residing in North Carolina, Drs. Virgil Lattimore and Homer Ashby. And if you're wondering where I fall within the lineage, I'm a fourth generation scholar with perhaps two generations behind me. And it depends on how you count the generations. There may only be one behind me. My third project was provoked by the killing of Michael Brown by Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. While I did not travel to Ferguson, I was invited to be a panelist at important events that reflected on the numerous police-involved shootings that occurred in 2014. One of those contexts was the Womanist Inn Gathering at the American Academy of Religion in San Diego, California. The Inn Gathering has traditionally been an all African American women's space, but in 2014, it was opened to include men. I, perhaps, became the first man to be a panelist within that space. It was within that sacred space that many of our womanist PhD students heard my journey into womanism for the first time. Just as Dr. Williams, Dolores Williams, declared Hagar's story as more reflective of and can be more liberating for African American women, I've held that Ishmael's story, particularly in relationship with his mother, is more reflective of and can be more liberating for African American men. In recognition and honor of the influence of Dr. Williams, my third project of 2014 is entitled Sisters with Sons in the Wilderness. To the extent that we can reflect on and affirm the dynamics between Hagar and Ishmael, we have a resource for analyzing and critiquing communal suffering within Ferguson and across the length and breadth of this nation. Linking the numerous shootings of 2014 with the history of lynching, I connect a series of dots between the Hagar-Ishmael narrative, the 1911 double lynching of Laura Nelson and her son L.D. Nelson, and the multiple narratives of African-American boys and women, or excuse me, boys and men, like Michael Brown, killed and no one being charged with their murder. The photograph of the Nelson's lynch bodies from a bridge outside of Okima, Oklahoma, is the only photograph of a lynched mother and son. However, the wailing of mothers because of their sons has not ended. This has been a retrospective overview of 2014. My research findings are really too numerous to share in one convocation moment. The year seemed to zip by. <laughs> but lest you think all I did was work the entire year, I leave you with this image of summer fun. Thank you so much.
set me free. God has smiled on me. God's been good to me. God has smiled on me. God has set me free. God has smiled on me. God's been good to me. God is the source of all my joy God fills me with all love the grace that I that I implore God sends down from above God has smiled on me God has set me free oh God has smiled on God's been so good to me. A light unto my path is God. My strength when I would fall. each day for me for me for me God is my all and all oh God has smiled on me God has set me free oh god has smiled on me god's been good god's been so good god's been good god's been Mighty, 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 mighty good. Oh, God's been good to me. God's been good to you. Oh, God's been good to you. Let us pray. Most gracious and compassionate one, you have indeed been good to us. You have indeed smiled on us. And we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt during this time. We thank you for the spirit that is this convocation. We thank you 
so much for what has teased our minds during this time. We thank you that you call us to love you with our heart, our soul, and yes, with our mind. We pray, merciful one, that you would forgive us for those things that we've said, that we've done, that have reaped violence on our brothers and our sisters. Forgive us for where our mouths and our hands have traumatized those who are dear to us. Forgive us and give us the grace to grow and to mature, to be what you would have us to be in this place called CTS, in this city, in this state, in this nation, in this world. Now, our provider, we thank you for the food that you have given to us. We thank you for the labor, for the sowing and the reaping and the harvesting that have gone to prepare a table before us. And even in our gluttony, help us to remember those who are without. Help us to remember those who go day by day without homes, without food, without clean water. You invoke us, you provoke us to do something about those who don't have. And now in the love that is everlasting, in the peace that passes all understanding, in the grace that is sufficient, in the mercy that meets every need, in the joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, dismiss us from this place, but never from your divine and holy presence. This we pray, amen.